Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Formcast podcast. My name is Eric Galina, and I'm the founder of Form Trends. Now, today we have a very special episode for you. I'm not actually going to be on this podcast. I'm handing it over instead to Pierre Port Andriani, who is going to be speaking with Brian Baker, who is the VP of Education and the principal historian at the Automotive Hall of Fame in Dearborn, Michigan. Now, they're going to be talking about the history of the sedan and if there's any life in this three box format in the future. So, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over. Hope you enjoy the episode. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the podcast. Today, I have a very special guest. Uh, please welcome Brian Baker. He's the Vice President of Education and the Principal Historian at the Automotive Hall of Fame. Brian, welcome. Well, thank you, Pierre. And it's great to see you again, old friend. Uh, it, it really is wonderful to reconnect with you. It is great to see you too as well. Uh, can you please tell everyone uh, a little bit of your background before we get into the discussion? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to. Um, obviously, um, Pierre and I know each other because of our years uh, in the design world, of which I was uh, a part for uh, 35 plus years. Uh, now I am uh, the, uh, the head of education and history here at the Automotive Hall of Fame uh, in Dearborn, Michigan, just outside of Detroit. And uh, in that role, I interact with all the automakers, all the, uh, the museums of the world, the, uh, the historians. I'm president of a, a, a chapter of the Society of Automotive Historians. And basically, I get to, uh, to research and study uh, the things that uh, I would be doing anyway if I weren't at the Hall of Fame. So I'm one of those lucky guys getting paid to do what he loves doing. And uh, because of that, uh, uh, when, when Pierre reached out to me, I said, absolutely, friend, I'm, I'm happy to share what I know with you and, uh, and your viewers. So thanks so much for having me today. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll share a little more about what I do as we go through the story. Sounds great. For the little story, Brian was my first teacher in Alias 3D. So I wow. owe you the path of my career. So thank you for that. <laughs> I am so honored to hear that. That is a great, that's a, a, a great footnote. I do still teach at the, both the College for Creative Studies and Lawrence Technical University here in the area. Um, but mostly I focus on the history of uh, the Industrial Revolution and the history of the automobile. Well, that sounds fascinating. And you're the right person to ask about the history of the sedan. So I was going to write about, because I am I love the sedan as a body form and I've owned sedans. So I have a really big, you know, soft spot in my heart with a sedan. So when I was going to write about it and research it, it started to be really broad. And I was thinking, who can I talk to about this topic? And your name obviously popped up. So well, let's take it from the beginning, the sedan, where does that come from? Well, I'm going to, I may surprise you a little, because I'm going to go back to the 17th century. The 1600s uh, was the first time the term sedan was used. Sedan was the name for uh, when, when the really wealthy did not want to be among the unwashed masses, uh, and they would hire people to carry them around in those little boxes with a single chair in them, uh, and for, for usually big, strong guys on holding them up on their shoulders. Those were actually the first things called sedans. It was private. It was prestigious. It was what became sedan later. But the first time an automaker used the term was 1912. And it's the oldest name in, in the automotive realm because before Studebaker made automobiles, starting in 1850, they built carriages. Uh, so the, act, the, the linkage between the 1700s, uh, the 1600s and, and carriage building and the idea of a private formal sedan uh, makes sense why Studebaker would be the one to kind of put the term to use. And, and it got used by, um, quickly adopted by all the automakers. People liked the idea, well, a sedan sounds so stately and elegant and, and formal. And, and the cars were, those first, those early Studebakers, if you don't mind, I'll hold up a photo. I've got one, I've got one here. Uh, here's, here's one on the left in this book on Studebaker. Oh, wow. You know, formal sedans, very upright, rigid side glass, uh, great, great for uh, looking out of, not necessarily great for aerodynamics, uh, but that's okay. That changes because as the term sedan gets, uh, gets used uh, through the 20s and 30s, when the automobile 
really comes of age and, and the era of Art Deco and streamlining. Uh, GM started calling, GM and Harley Earl and his people started calling them sedanettes when they wanted to do a sport roof all the way, you know, one, one drooping, careful, beautiful line all the way down to the rear bumper. Those were sedanettes. Uh, and, and that went into the, the war years um, where car design was, was actually illegal to do. Not many people know that. I didn't know uh, that. When, 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 the, when the U.S. declared war uh, on uh, Japan and, and the Axis powers and such, uh, all automobile development had to stop. By by the laws of the of the United States, at least, uh, every uh, all the automotive companies were instructed: you will direct your efforts to the war effort, and they did. They stopped everything. They they did all this. So what Pierre, you what you and I did for a living was illegal for a number wow. of years because uh, you simply weren't allowed to focus on what kind of cars were going to come after the war. Well, I've learned that there were some secret studios. <laughs> uh, certainly here in Detroit. Harley Earl had one on 2nd Avenue, not far from where his styling studios were. And he had a number of individuals whose time was being billed to something else, but they were making scale models of future sedans and, and what, what cars would look like after the war. And this is where all the, the aircraft influence that right. was going on during the war, the fins and all the, the fuselages and the torpedo bodies, uh, they were doing some wild looking sedans. And a few of those have, have survived in photographs. Uh, again, it was all top secret stuff. Uh, Studebaker comes back into the story again here because during the war years, they were over in South Bend, Indiana. Not as many government people hanging out in the South Bend as there were in Detroit. So they were kind of working behind the scenes on what kind of a car they were going to do. And they debuted their sedans. They were the first to market. After the victory in Europe and victory in, in uh, Japan, uh, they were the first American automaker to get back into the marketplace. Obviously, the auto industry in Germany and Italy and everywhere else was devastated. We had bombed the hell out of it, right? Same thing in Japan. A lot of the industry was destroyed. So here's America with the first to reemerge after the war with, with these uh beautiful cars. And for a period, um, for the wealthy, getting a Cadillac sedan was more prestigious than owning a Rolls Royce. They, yeah, actually, I'm going to pause you on that because you yeah. mentioned the at the beginning, it was a uh, rich people's way of, you know, carriage. And then you're after the war, you still have, you know, Cadillac and all the fins. So does the sedan have this upper class uh, feel to it already? It definitely did. Um, the few the few cars that were allowed to be built during the war years, World War II here, uh, were cars for staff generals and and the, the the military elite. Now they were painted drab green. They were sort of the the, the matte finish that's so popular uh, the last ten years or so was way, they were way ahead of the curve. They were all painted drab flat colors so they wouldn't shine and be as visible by aircraft over overhead. But again, here these authority figures, Patton. Uh, Eisenhower, all these 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 leaders, uh, Montgomery in, in in England and such, they were all uh, running around in sedans. So even during the war, a sedan was a, a prestige. You know, if you didn't have money, you were in a jeep, right? You were you were a sergeant driving a jeep. But the sedan uh, made it through the war years and then uh, resumes its spot as uh, uh, the more formal vehicle. Wow, very interesting. So then after the war, so the 60s, then we, you know, come up to the Malays, well, before the Malays. So, I mean, the sedan got bigger and bigger until the oil production problem yeah. hit, right? Yeah, from, from 1948, when, when auto production really resumed uh, in America, um, the, the car just every one way to give the customer perceived value in, by American standards, when gasoline was 10, 15 cents a gallon was to make it a couple inches longer every year. And the stylists loved it because it gave them more sheet metal to put curves on and you know just lop another load of clay on there and, and, and we'll add six inches to the back end. Of, and it, this got really out of control. Um, I own a 1971 Buick Riviera, which weighs almost three tons and is, and is, is 227 inches long. It's massive. Wow. And and it barely fits in my garage. 
uh, my son parks his first generation Mazda RX-7 next to it. And it, you know, could practically fit in the trunk. But, but these cars became so gargantuan. There was no end in sight until, as you mentioned, the, oil Arab, the Arab oil embargo of 73. When they, when they cut the flow of oil and suddenly gasoline was not available, uh, it, was a, it was a total reinvention of, of what sedans meant to everyone. People were trading in Cadillacs to get uh, Volkswagens or diesel Mercedes, anything that got you know, uh, better fuel economy. And, and simply because of space limitations and the, the cost of fuel overseas, both in Asia and in Europe, um, they just had the right size sedans. And it took uh, America a long time to get over that idea that bigger isn't necessarily better, which, which really led us up to uh, the 1980s when, when, when it becomes a more global market and, and vehicles, uh, Americans start to recognize the value of uh, smaller sedans. And there was a whole generation of German sedans coming into, uh, into the U.S. market. And companies like Ford creating the Taurus SHO, which I believe you owned one. They did. Uh, it, tell, tell me about that for you. Was that your first four-door? Uh, to, uh, thinking back, it was. I used to have a VW Beetle convertible, and mm-hmm. that caught fire. <laughs> sadly it's another story but yeah i think that was my uh and i think it was my first uh i would like to say sports sports sedan because i also had a you know, i give a lot of credit to ford for you know uh teaming up uh was yours with the yamaha motor the yamaha, yamaha motor? Six, yep. yeah you know uh ford ford is i give them a lot of credit for for reaching across the shores uh or reaching across the ocean and getting the right power plant that really that car was a a barnstormer it was fast Uh, they were they were really quick but also uh got to give a nod to nissan i believe they were the first ones to advertise the four-door sports car they call it that the maximas and correct was it the the maxima i believe the first generation maxima was i think 87 88 Mm -hmm. and then i also had a 91 maxima well handed down from my parents but yeah. again, I, I love the four door and I love the, it's not a pure sports car, but you know, it's fast enough and uh, I really enjoy it. And as, as a design element, I always love the, the sectioning, you know, engine compartment and trunk. And I think the three box shape, I always have a big, big weakness for it. Well, and it, it obviously the, the logic of it took hold. I mean, uh, I have a lot of memories of, of two doors and coupes that I owned over the years where getting in the back seat required a gymnastics background. You know, you, you just it, tilting seats forward and getting in behind the, the driver was was almost impossible in some of them. Uh, a great footnote here. Um, Little American Motors, when they made the Pacer, the AMC Pacer in the late 70s, Mm-hmm. One of the things they did to deal with the challenges of not being a dad was they made the passenger side door about four and a half inches longer than the driver's side door. Really? And uh, that's, uh, that was uh, uh, to make it easier to get in and out of the back seat. So, um, so, so we're getting into the 80s, and suddenly uh, the world discovers uh, the ultimate driving machines from BMW. Everybody wants a three series BMW. It's the best selling car in the world. Over 300,000 per year were being sold worldwide. Everyone, you know, discovered that just because it had four doors didn't mean it wasn't nimble. I mean, this, Uh, at the time, the Germans were really doing the sedan really well. Like if we think about the 190E with a big wing, or then the hammer, and then, you know, the M5, obviously. But in the UK, they had the Lotus Carlton, which I absolutely love. So that's where I think I got my, uh, this is where it all, you know, started Do you follow for me. the market on Lotus Carlton's? Are they, are they affordable still? Are they, uh, have they, is the market no. <laughs> driven them out of, out of control? No, they're not as bad as, let's say, getting a Ford Cosworth, but it's still not cheap because sure. they didn't make that many and people really like them and they know their value. Speaking of which, we were talking a little bit, and you mentioned about the collector's car market for sedans. Yeah, 
I spend a lot of time uh, following uh, auction results and, and actually going when I can in person to, uh, uh, to concours events and to uh, auctions uh, like the Scottsdale auctions in Kissimmee, Florida and others. And for decades, uh, buying the four-door, the, the sedan version of most collector cars was like, it was, the, it was the entry level. It was the way if I couldn't afford a 57 Chevy at $100,000, I could buy the nicest 57 Chevy four-door for about 20, 25. Um, people simply, collectors weren't even interested in them if they had four doors. Uh, that, that really has, that's been a revelation the last 15 to 20 years. Suddenly four doors and wagons, wagon variants are, are hot, hot items. And, and, and fetch better prices sometimes than the coupes. It's like the market got saturated on, on coupes and, and suddenly people say, well, these, these sedans, and generally the sedans were more gently cared for in their day, so they survived better and they were better investments. Uh, but, but sedans have finally, uh, you know, there's, there's still no mistaking a, a, you know, a fuel injected 57 Chevy two door is still going to get a Bel Air is going to get more than a four door uh, sedan version, but you get all the joy of the two door, you know, and, <laughs> and you get, you, you, you can get more room for your friends and you can get in, in and out easier. Uh, there is just a pure, uh, it's just common sense tells you, Hey, this is a better design. You know, uh, it wasn't about, it was more substance than just styling. And that, that's what I think bodes well for the future of the sedan. Actually, well, that now we're at about in the 90s, let's say 2000, 2010, now with the rise of the SUV. So the sales for the sedan have plummeted worldwide as everybody loves the SUV. There are still sedans for sale in the U.S., but again, the, their sales have been catalyzed. How do you see the market right now or where it's going? Well, I, trying to look at it globally, first of all, uh, you know, the sedan market has never... Uh, uh, died in Europe the way it, it did here in the States. Uh, obviously, in these, here in the States, uh, access to affordable fuel has never been a problem. Right. Uh, you know, we, we, we are blessed that we've had uh, lower fuel prices than most of the rest of the planet. Same, and the th roads. Same is true. Yes. And the, the same road is true. size in the UK, I tell you, it'll be hard to drive your caddy on, on some it, roads. <laughs> well, I remember I was in Tokyo a few years ago and seeing an Escalade trying to navigate downtown Tokyo traffic on a Friday night. Uh, it, it was a carnival. It was a moving parade. Just everybody was staring at this giant beast driving by, you know, and, and the idea that um, that that's what I think bodes well for a sedan. There's a logic to the size and scale of a sedan. Uh, you know, the, the, in the U S they've been slow to adopt it and it, and it goes way back. Um, in, in my history of the automobile course um, that I share with uh, visitors to the Hall of Fame, uh, th the real question is horsepower. And I mean horsepower, as in horses with hooves. Because if you go back in time to when the Romans built the first major road system in Europe, they had a certain gauge. Four feet, eight and a half inches was the specification for the distance between the wheels on a Roman general's chariot. It was pulled by two horses, right? They maintained that for all of the roads of Europe, that constant gauge, if you will. And it was adopted for railroads in the United States, by the way. That's the gauge. All of our roads in the U.S., our railroads are four and a half. But the idea of horses, play, uh, Roman generals were given two horses so that if one of their horses was killed, they could grab the other one and escape. So more power, more horsepower, right? Because I'm a general. Well, that, then transitioning to farmers and others who stopped riding on the horse itself and riding in surreys and other small carriages behind them, they had a horse. Then the wealthy people would have a couple of horses and they would have a separate carriage. And so, and they'd close themselves in a sedan box so they didn't have to smell the horse, right? And, but the real horsepower were the royals. The families, the royal family, when the king arrived in your village or town, he had a team of 16 horses or, you know, like Charles and Diana's wedding, all the great royal <laughs> weddings, these, these huge teams of horses. And this, this idea that 
that long train of horses out in front meant more power and more prestige. Well, this translated to the automobile. When you go to the 1920s and the sedans with the really long V16 hoods and the V12 hoods, they made that that long stand for people who don't, you know, just glance at a car. It, it stuck that I guess the the more expensive car is the one with that long hood. Well, we did tests on this in the 90s when I was with Chevrolet. We'd, we'd show people prototypes, either scale models, photographs, or full-size uh, properties. And we would put scanners, we, we had them put on this pair of glasses that would see, watch their eye movement. And we'd show them these vehicles and we'd ask them, which one's more expensive, this one or this one? And we found they looked at two things. The very first thing they looked at was the grill. A more upright grill said to them, it's, this is a more expensive car. The <laughs> length of the hood was definitely a factor. They would, you could see their eyes were scanning that. Uh, the third element was the sail panel back. It was how private was the passenger compartment. So mm. those three elements spoke to the prestige of a sedan. Uh -huh. and, and, and it stuck with us. And it gets, it, it's only now in the modern era of mobility and electric vehicles that we're going to get away from this long hood mindset uh, that, that stuck with us for so many years. Uh, yeah, so I'm excited I, about the future. Yeah, I, was, I remember when I was at GM and you were there too, we did the V16 Cadillac and then the Chevy SS concept and its hood was just enormous. It yes. looked great, I thought. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and there's something about that proportion that's very elegant. You know, that the long hood, a stubby hood, it's hard to make it look elegant. You know? Right. Uh, Bill Mitchell, who was, uh, he's in our Hall of Fame and was uh, the head of GM design for about 17 years. Uh, said, uh, you know, making a, a short car uh, look prestigious was like trying to make a tuxedo for a dwarf. Uh, it, it's not culturally sensitive today. He was a man of his times, but, but that's the, that, that's the, the truth. Uh, uh, he, he was trying to get, uh, you know, he was making the point because he was, he was a guy who had started his career in the 1930s uh, as the chief designer of Cadillac. And he went all the way up to 1977 with his career. And he was pinched by the oil embargo at the end of his, his time. And he, he was challenged, how do you make cars look prestigious with these short, short, much shorter cars? You know, take two feet off of them and make them look prestigious. And he did a very clever thing. Hmm. He stole from Rolls-Royce. Rolls-Royce in the 1950s had these beautiful, elegant long hoods and these really short truncated rear ends. Bustle trunk. Oh, uh, bustle. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. So when Bill Mitchell redesigned the Cadillac Seville during the fuel embargo, he took a Chevrolet Nova, very basic car. He took that chassis and he made the hood six inches longer. He's just stretched the hood, used the same chassis as the Chevrolet, stretched the hood. And instead of having a traditional three box or a trunk on the behind of it, he just made that little truncated bustle trunk. So the proportions of the car were those classic car long hood proportions just in, uh, in, in so he, he retained some of the, the elegance of the, uh, the classic car. Era. Yeah. The bustle top always bothered me for some reason. I feel like you get short change because you don't, you're missing a foot or something. But. It's a, it's a love hate kind of car, but <laughs> that car holds one interesting distinction. Almost every car introduced in the market anywhere in the world, it's best sales are usually the second year. The first year, it's a, people are discovering it. The second year, it takes off. And then it's a slow decline until the next body style. And that bustle trunk is one of the few cars in history that every year, while it was being produced, became more and more popular all the way through its run. Wow! So, so the public, uh, you know, they definitely liked it. Um, an interesting time. Um, yeah, what do we, I know? We, no, we in the design community are often ahead of public taste. You know, the, we're, we get too far ahead, and that's why Edsel's happen and things like that. Um, but I wanted to mention, um, we we're talking about the future of the sedan. Yeah. Uh, obviously, in the age of electrification, uh, it allows a reconfiguration of, of the components to the vehicle. Uh, you know, with hub motors and, and electric drivetrains underneath the floor and all this, you literally can put the passenger compartment almost anywhere you want. Right. Uh, and with collision avoidance systems and, and smart cars and the potential for vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications to 
make cars never hit one another, 99.58% of the time, whatever, suddenly we can change the proportions of cars in a way that we've never done. We've never been able you know, to, to put the passengers right at the front. Uh, because that's the crash zone, right? Yeah, and yeah. and such. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens with that. Yeah, that's interesting. Because 2012, obviously, that's Tesla Model S comes out and rewrites the book. But in proportion, it's it's pretty classical. And even mm -hmm. I mean, Tata, we did uh, you know a concept flagship named the E Vision, and it was still a really classic, you know, three box design. And if you look at you know the and the next generation of electric sedans, Lucid, or even now the new Neo, uh, even the Taycan, they still have the classic three-door layout. So is that because, is that inherited? Is that because of the batteries? Is it a mix of everything? What's your opinion? Well, we've obviously got more design freedom, and I think it's, I'm really excited about it because the last 15 years, as critical as we are looking in history's rearview mirror, at the 1970s and, and what happened with cars and, and all the extra bumpers and all the stuff that got added to them. The last 10 years, 15 really, uh, I'm critical because I could throw a moving blanket over every car in a parking lot. And almost all of them would be SUVs, first of all. And the proportions are indistinguishable. I can't you know, put a heavy cover over most SUVs. I can't tell you if it's a Mercedes or a Nissan or a Ford. I'm excited about the potential for a range of forms and proportions in cars that hasn't been possible before because crash technology and all that just kept adding more and more mass to the perimeters of the vehicles. Mm -hmm. If cars truly can be designed uh, to not hit one another or hit other objects. Uh, the design world has the opportunity to make a wide range of proportions like we haven't seen in cars in 100 years. If you go back 100 years, cars were all different sizes and shapes uh, and such. Uh, you know, one of my favorites in the early days of the automobile was a car called the American Underslung. And they simply rearranged the springs to be above the axles instead of below them. And the car was like a foot and a half lower. It was the Lamborghini of its time. It was like a foot and a half lower than a Model T Ford, but it was practical. It still worked on the roads and, and everything. I think we have the opportunity in the future with electrification and, and the technology that we're pioneering to really um, offer the customers something different. If, you, if everyone, you, not everyone wants the same shape. True. But again, the shape of a car has been you know, defined for a long time. Do you think that will shock people to travel in a quote unquote an egg, for example? Well, I think I think there's always going to be a percentage of people who are the pioneers and, and want something a little different. And guys like you bought a Volkswagen Beetle, you know, I mean, that you wanted something <laughs> different, right? That's and that's God bless you. That's those are the customers that designers love to design for. And a vast a lot of people are saying, well, the, the, the age of mobility and, and all this is just going to be a glass box of wheels. And I think, oh my God, I hope not. I really, I think we have the opportunity to do so much more with them. Now, admittedly, we can be much more efficient and maximize them. Um, I had a conversation not long ago with legendary uh, designer and a, a member of our Hall of Fame since 2017, Ed Welburn. Ed boss? Welburn, uh, yeah, our old boss, a great designer. Mm -hmm. uh, and and he's, you know, he's, he's retired several years now. We had a chance to talk. And I asked him about the future of, of vehicles. And he, he said, you know what? He says, and he, he hearkened back to the mid 50s, uh, tri five Chevrolets, 55, 56, 57 Chevrolet. They were wildly popular. No more popular, by the way, the Fords outsold the Chevys in those, the, those years. Uh, but the, the cars are about the same size. And he pointed out, Ed's getting along in years. Sorry, Ed. If you're watching this, uh, he's getting along in years. And, and he pointed out to me, he says, getting in and out of or climbing up into an SUV for a whole generation of us is just not going to be practical. And he talked about how easy it was to get in and out of those mid 50s cars, that it's almost a horizontal movement. They're not super low. They're not slammed to the ground and hmm. sports car like they were just very easy to open the door. You're, you're slide your butt in on the couch and close the door and you were in. Um, 
there's something to that. The, the, the classic uh, checker taxi cab is a great example of that. They, part of why they were so successful for, for 50 years was that the checker cab was painless to get in and out of, even if you had to carry your luggage in with you as you got into, yeah. the, into the vehicle. Um, so and by the way, taxis yeah. in England are still like that. It's yes, you're right. Easy exactly. To... The classic English cab is uh, is exactly like that. Yeah. It's and that and Ed's contention, uh, you know, having some time to be independent of the industry is that the sedan will come back. The sedan mm. makes more sense than an SUV. Uh, you know, the body on frame chassis of SUVs uh, is inherently heavy. And and as we get try to make cars have longer ranges with electricity and and the and the motor system, we're going to look for lighter solutions. And the lighter solution is a unibody sedan. Uh, and, and but but I don't think we're going to go uh, for years. Longer, lower, wider was what the car industry was pushing. Uh, I, I think we've we've gotten past that now, and people don't mind a little higher, you know, more upright upper. Uh, it it it's nicer to ride in, uh, you know, than a, a little gun slot windshield. So uh, I think the sedan will have its day again. It, it makes sense. Uh, more, it makes a lot more sense than a giant Escalade. Yeah, it's interesting because as obviously as boomers retire, they still want their freedom. And yeah, they still want to not to climb into a car or sling down into a car. So it does make a lot of sense, especially if you if you had autonomous driving capabilities, then you're really onto something very different. I could see that. In in I did some travels in India, uh, and 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 spoke at some automotive conferences there. I gotta and ask, where did you go in India? I was in Pune, uh, speaking okay. at, at an automotive conference there, and then I cried. Then I went down to uh, Bangalore, uh, and then I went over to uh, um, uh, in the south. The, the, the Simi Valley of uh, uh, technology. And anyway, number of places. And everywhere I went, uh, I even found some car museums. Everywhere I go, I find car museums to visit. I've been to over 175 auto museums around the world. And, and, and the number is still going up. I'll break 200 soon. I'll let you know. Very nice. Um, but, but it is uh, uh, the, the small uh, British-derived, mostly uh, sedans that, that are uh, the most common you know, there. Uh, in addition to the the Asian imports that are that are a big part of of that market, uh, you know, your company Tata uh, has a, a vested interest in uh, the uh, the tens of millions of people that are there. You know, that what what they what they what what will make sense for them. I mean, not everyone uh, can get by with a nano. They sure. need they need they need something larger, especially with with families and and I, my hat is off to uh, the Indian community for their creativity. With when, when I see their lorries and their their trucks carrying things that uh, are three times the size of the truck, I'm always amazed. So uh, I'm I'm excited to see as India develops its own aesthetic, and that that was honestly when I when I spoke in India, that's one of the challenges I gave the people from the industry there was. India has this amazing architectural history, this amazing color history with their festivals every spring and all of this. Why don't I see that in the, in the cars? You know, the cars are nice, very tasteful uh, cars and, and, and they're getting better every every year. But I think there's an opportunity to celebrate their own culture and not just do it And also it's a really young population. So I think you have yeah. room to do something even more audacious than you would in, you know, in Europe or the States and from yes. that point of view. Well, I, I want to make certain before we wrap up, I extend an invitation to all of your viewers to come visit me at the Automotive Hall of Fame Absolutely. outside of Detroit. We're in Dearborn, right next to the Henry Ford Museum. Uh, and uh, feel free to ask for me if you're watching this podcast, you're a friend of Pierre's, you're a friend of mine. So uh, I would be honored to, uh, to give you a walkthrough of our history uh, museum and uh and tell you about the things that we do if you visit us at the automotive hall of fame dot org uh you'll learn more about us and uh and read some some things that uh, uh i write about the history of uh, the automobile and and we link to friends like pierre for his podcasts so uh, i want to thank you for inviting me to come chat with you today i don't know where time went i mean it just flew by for me and uh 
to conclude, well, I'm glad I'm not the only one who likes to dance. And from what you're telling me, there's still a lot of design solution that could be brought back by the sedan. So yeah, the SUV is king, but hopefully, you know, the car design for sedan still has a, a lot of life into it. So that's, re that's comforting for me anyway. Absolutely. Long live the sedan. Thank you again, friend. Great, great to see you. And uh, I hope your, uh, your viewers enjoyed this. And I'm sure they will. And please visit the uh, Hall of Fame, Automotive Hall of Fame online, or if you're in Dearborn, by all yeah. means, go visit. Look me up. Mm -hmm.